All right, welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good. I wanna, I wanna start by hoping, wishing, thinking, sending out thoughts as we always try to send good thoughts out to our fans, uh, to the boxing audience, the MMA audience, uh, everybody who's listening, just good people. We hope you, all the fathers out there, hope you had a great Father's Day. How was your Father's Day, Ken? It was lovely. They usually just let me do whatever I want to do, which is lay around the house and do nothing. But that's every day, isn't it, Ken? I mean, <laughs> no, Father's no Day, I wish. No? Oh, okay. No. Father's Day is supposed to be different, right? It's supposed to be special. Yeah. yeah, we threw some passes. We threw some passes, played wiffle ball. I got a new uh, cold plunge, so the kids all tried to get in the cold plunge, insisting that they could do it. They all lasted about three or four seconds, and then... That's the last we'll ever hear of the cold plunge, which is nice. Um, but you know, it was it was nice. It was just nice to be in, at home with the kids and my wife, and it was beautiful. I, How about we, you? What'd you do? Yeah, we had a great day. We went to Jersey to uh, to my son in law Jeff's brother Michael's uh, uh, country club over in New Jersey, where we had a barbecue there. It was beautiful. There's horses there. Uh, the kids were able to feed the horses some carrots uh, and stuff, and it was just a you know it was a gorgeous day. I was with all my you know the, I'm missing my son and and his son and his wife. They're in Vegas, but uh, I was with my grandchildren. You know my daughter's two children, uh, little Mara, little little Joseph, and uh, with my wife and daughter. And as I said. My son-in-law, his his brother's family. So it was, it was beautiful. It was it was nice. It was, it was, uh, it was just a beautiful day. Uh, like you said, just relaxing. And I'm sticking on my diet. Um, I'm down nine pounds. Um, I brought, I brought my athletic greens. People were like, in the country, what's that? Um, what what? That's not a you know. What is that? That's uh. Not iced tea. That's not uh, a hamburger. That's not a hot dog. I said no. That's athletic greens, um, <laughs> and it 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 helps. So anyway, uh, all good in that department. And again, uh, all the fathers out there that are good enough to listen to this show, uh, hope you had a great day, fathers. You know. I was thinking we just pass it by, right, Ken? You know, Father's yeah. Day. Okay, you 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 have a barbecue. You you with your family. It's a day off. It's a day of relaxation, all that day. But for me, it's a day of reflection, because when you see in the news nowadays, the, you know, the stuff going on, whether it's a politician, a government official talking, or whatever, somebody. But and and they're talking about, you know, that we have to. We have to do something about the gas prices, about the shortage of baby formula. But I mean, there's so many, so many difficult things going on in this country right now and so many crises and, and so many things, you know, to point at. But you know what? It was funny. I was talking to my daughter and it I was sitting at the table and I just said, you know, one of the most important things we need in this country now, tomorrow, yesterday, always is fathers fathers not not so the population gets bigger so so that <laughs> we don't need that but so that kids can be brought up and given the right tools and the right direction the right guidance to become what they deserve to become the best people they can in the world to become productive human beings that can add to our society that can make our society better. Fathers. I was thinking that. It just I said, yeah, we just make it Father's Day. Okay, you get a tie, you know? <laughs> you get you get a shirt. You know, I got a shirt. I got a couple of shirts. Um uh, they were nice. They were nice. I got shorts too. But in all seriousness, that's what's missing. Yeah, I know the other things are important. I get it. I do. There's so many, but always at the top of the list should be we need more fathers because when you have fathers there in their children's lives 
things are usually have a better chance of being better. Where again, they have guidance. Of course, they have love. They get that from their mother, their grandparents. I get it. But a father, they need the direction. They need the teaching, the leadership, the role model of a father. That's what we need. We need more and more of that in this country to make things better. Anyway, I wanted to say that. That's my two cents on that. And um, also, we, uh, I want to I wanna give you my man over here his due. I always try to do that. And, you know, it's, I mean, this, instead of this being uh, the fight with Teddy Atlas, it could also be known as sort of a weekly series, you know, where it's called maybe something like, uh, you know, as the star grows, because <laughs> my man here, as the star grows, you know, kind of like one of those soap operas, you know what I mean? As the world spins, as the world turns, you know, obviously you could tell I didn't watch too many soap operas, but... Um, I'm just proud that I'm part of helping this star that keeps getting bigger get put into the sky to begin with, to, to lift him a little bit, a little, because now he's, not, he's becoming a Nova. See, I know a little bit about <laughs> science. Does, he's becoming a supernova. And in all seriousness, I want to, I'm, I'm, we joke around and everything. But I am proud that you're getting your due in a lot of ways, you're, or you, you're making your due, and you're getting recognized in a lot of ways for things that uh, you deserve to be. Uh, one of them is your running acumen, your running abilities, your dedication to that sport. And there was a big story that just was done in the New York Times. Yeah, it's not what it used to be, the New York Times. I mean, it's doing head stories on, on you. But <laughs> um, no, in all, all seriousness, um, I'm glad that they did the story. I'm glad that uh, you're, you're being recognized for your, you know, what you're being recognized for, your running abilities and your determination at 50 years old, being basically the top... Basically, the top runner, I think they call it the Masters, um, if I'm not wrong, the Masters uh, division, the top runner in the world, in the Masters. I mean, I know you've, you've, you've ventured around the world. Your plan is to continue. You're going to conquer. You're going to be like Godzilla. You're going to conquer Japan. You're going <laughs> to, uh, I mean, you are a monster. You are a monster. So I think that's a fair analogy. Um, but you're going to other solar systems. <laughs> and I just want to tell you, I'll bring your head down a little bit, a little tiny bit, after picking it up the way I just did, where <laughs> um, I'm glad they concentrated on your running abilities and accomplishment, not your sports handicapping abilities, because <laughs> the Boston Celtics, your team, your Boston Celtics, they, they didn't do that good. They didn't no. do. They didn't do quite that good. Take it from. Take it from there, Ken. Uh, congratulations on the New York Times story. Uh, thank you. Yep, my friend Matt Futterman wrote an article about my recent successes at in New York and Boston with the major marathons. I'm going to run Berlin and uh, and uh, London in the fall, and then t uh, Tokyo next March. But uh, yeah, the Celtics, man. Oh, so disappointing. They played really poorly in that game six. I thought maybe we could force a game seven. But to be cand candidly speaking, I didn't think that they would had this potential halfway through the season. I was like, oh, maybe they'll make the playoffs. I didn't think that they had the potential to hit reach the finals. And um, Steph Curry and uh, uh, Golden State Warriors were just too damn good. Um, man, when they were click when, when Golden State's clicking, they were you couldn't stop them. Oh, they um, got a dynasty. Final. How many how many yeah. championships is that? How many is I that in the have, last seven, eight years? Have, I think they have four. Four in the last seven, right? Eight years, maybe seven, six years. years. I think they've been in the fight. yeah, something. They have some they're on a crazy run, and that Steph Curry is just man, is he good. 
he can shoot from anywhere and just he has the perfect supporting cast Draymond Green when he's bad he's really bad but when he's good he's an unbelievable force um well, he's like a yeah, Dennis just, Rodman. He's that cog. He's that, or, or, or Horace Grant for the Bulls, or, yeah. or uh, Charles Oakley for the Knicks back in the day, or, you know, whatever. But he's the guy that gets the dirty work done. And it's Definitely. so important to have that guy. And I'm going to piggyback off of what you just said. First of all, there's another Bostonian. You're a Bostonian. But there's <laughs> another Bostonian, Ken that was more disappointed, I think, than you. He was sitting front row, David Portnoy, uh, El Presidente, who um, founded uh, Ballroom Sports, Barstool Sports, I'm sorry. Barstool Sports, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, you know, he's he, he's just tremendously successful and popular, um, and we like him. Uh, he, he was sitting front row, and so he's disappointed, but we did an interview with him, so I just figured it'd be a, good way of putting it in there reminding people that's going to be coming up on i believe the 28th of the month that that interview will be out and it's a really good interview matter of fact uh i usually don't highlight interviews ahead of time but i'm highlighting it because he he gives some inside information about his visit to the white house that would be very interesting i think to some people when he visited the white house interviewing president trump uh, so I think that that's an interview to look. And also, I have to mention this. Again, I, it's usually not my way. Um, but Christy Martin, her interview, uh, I, 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 you'll be talking about it, I think, at the end of this show um, that it's coming up. But uh, you got to hear it. You got to hear it. And you, and you better bring a couple tissues. Um because you might dab at your eyes a little bit. But it's an important story. It's a riveting story. A riveting story. She's a pioneer of women's boxing. We know all that. World champion women's boxer, tough, everything, great fights. We know all that. But do you know her story, her life story? The fight for her survival? And that's the name of a book. So um, anyway, I, I, I just needed to say that. And I want to touch real quick about these uh this dynasty with the golden state warriors it reminds me of the chicago bulls you know they had their superstar <laughs> maybe the greatest player of all time michael jordan uh the warriors have one of the i think you're gonna have to put them in that conversation now ken maybe one of the great definitely the greatest shooter of all time but maybe one of the greatest players of all time now steph curry uh you got him but there's always the it's always the other cogs in, in the wheel of you or the spokes in the wheel of your will you know th those th those players that fit roles there's always those guys that are so important so important for the team to be successful with the superstar you know of course there's clay thompson who's tremendous even though he's come off some injuries he's tremendous but green as you just mentioned um there, there's always those guys that fill their roles um and and did the job uh, with the warriors they created a lot of turnovers uh those guys are so important and i was thinking about it the similarities with steph curry and jordan are really if you think about it it's amazing because with all these championships, you go to Jordan. What he, I think he won six with the Bulls. There was always one of those guys. They kept coming, they, and they were interchangeable. There were different ones that were those role players. Whether it was Paxton, uh, Kerr, Kukos, um, you know, Horace Grant. Uh, of course, Scotty Pippen was. Uh, he was like a co-star with him in a way, um, kind of like Clay Thompson is a little bit too. With with curry so i think there's a lot of similarities between those two dynasties yeah i think that if if they didn't give the mvp to curry who ran away with it i think the next best the next man in line was obviously wiggins he was unbelievable every time he got the ball and had a chance to wheel and deal he just destroy there it but is. when you got a guy like steph curry who's gonna take half the shots you know and then you got four other guys divvying up the other half it was hard to stand out, and Wiggins managed to do it. He was awesome. Every time he got the ball, I'm like, oh, no, please double team him. Do something. He's just unstoppable at times. But uh, congratulations to Golden State. They looked awesome. They deserved it. They all played the Celtics. And again, very similar. To, you just described Wiggins perfectly. Very similar to the guys I just, Paxton, Kerr. 
you know, these guys, when you needed them, when Jordan needed them, when they needed them, three-pointer, bang. You know what I mean? Corner shot, bang. Yep. You know, <laughs> uh, top of the key, bang. You know, they, they would come through. So I guess what I'm trying to say and I'll put forward more is that, yeah, the superstars are the superstars, but you always need the surrounding pieces. You always yep. need the teammates because at the end of the day, it's the best team. And the that's Warriors right. were the best team. And their superstar didn't show up for the last game. I think that's fair. Tatum, you know, they, yeah. they, they, they needed him. They needed their superstar to show up at that point. You know, that's when you need them to show up. And um, he didn't, you know, he didn't quite. And one last thing. They played defense too, Ken. You know, yeah, uh, yeah they're that juggernaut of offense, the Warriors. But they played defense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they looked great. Yeah. Um, but uh, just to emphasize what you said earlier, that I just want to confirm that, yes, a week from tomorrow, we got Dave Portnoy, Barstool Sports founder, um, friend of the show, coming on. Big interview. You're going to enjoy that one. At the end of today's show, please stick around for the Christy Martin interview. I guarantee this will be one of your favorite interviews we've ever done. Like Teddy said, it's a real tearjerker. When you hear what she went through, it's just it's madness. I like a lot of the details I wasn't aware of until today, and it's... Uh, Man, what a story of redemption and survival. Um, congrats to Christy Martin, newest member of the Boxing Hall of Fame, joining the great Teddy Atlas in the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And if you want, and, and her, her author too, Ron Borch, that's, that's unheard of. The guy that wrote yeah. it, who's a friend of mine, who wrote the book with her, Ron Borch is writer from Boston. Oh my goodness, we got too many Boston people <laughs> around here. Um, we got to fix that. We got to clean that up a little bit. But he he's the writer. So, yeah, it's a good team. Talk about team, right? Team, team, team. Uh, good, good team there, you know, helping each other, doing it the right way. And I'll just say one last thing before we get to the boxing and the UFC uh, for the week, that if you want your an autograph from Ken, uh, you you have to, I don't know exactly, we're trying to work on it, how to do this, but if you become a subscriber, we're at 265,000 subscribers, and we're growing, and we want to keep growing. So if you want to keep subscribing, and at some point we'll figure out what number subscriber gets that autograph from uh, from Ken Rideout. We'll, we'll figure out how to do that. Ken's probably thinking about so it. You have, to, you have to attend the Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner on Staten Island in November, the Thursday before Thanksgiving. If you're at that um, dinner, you get an autograph and a uh, picture and anything else you want to. See what I mean about teamwork? Now that's, see that, that's teamwork. And that sort of just um, makes me feel good that, you know, that I do have the right guy with me, that I did choose the right guy uh, to bring on this journey, uh, and to f and I have a reason to feel good about uh, where he's going. So, uh, actually, you know what that reminded me of, Teddy? Anyone who buys a um, one of the jerseys from the uh, Box Raw collection at uh, boxraw.com. Search Teddy Atlas. Go to the 36 collection. Anyone that buys a jersey there brings it to that dinner. Teddy and I will both sign it and take a picture with you. How's that? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. That, uh, yep, that sounds good. It, it, it really does. And uh, it'll be a, it won't be an extra large shirt. It'll be a large or medium by then because I would have lost more weight. <laughs> good point uh, let's get into some boxing it was a uh, great um, oh, man better be of what a juggernaut but let's start with the co-main uh, Robicio Ramirez uh, in action after bouncing back after his debut loss against a he bounced back uh, in his last nine fights he fought uh, Abraham Nova put him out cold but I, the thing i love about rubicio ramirez a uh, two-time olympic gold medalist if i'm not mistaken teddy from cuba um defected first fight first pro fight in the u.s takes an l unexpectedly a split decision lost and has since gone on a uh a nine fight win streak with ten, with six knockouts in, in in against a formidable opponent 21 and 0 Abraham Nova and Ramirez just beat the brakes off him. How'd you like that fight and how'd you think Ramirez looked? 
Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna segue off of what you just said. I'm gonna, I listen. I, I don't just, I have my things to say, but I listen, and then I adjust, I adapt, and I'm gonna adapt off of that because you made a good point there. Is it better to be 21 and 0 or 9 and 1? What do I? What does Teddy mean by that? Well. Nine and one means you fought better opposition. Means twenty one and zero. You know, yeah, you aren't fighting the best opposition on the way up. And Teddy, if I can hi- if I can give you an example, we can uh, pan to uh, Edgar Berlanga with like sixteen knockouts 100%. in a row, and then yeah, my, my God, like first it, round, his whole, first his round. Whole, his whole career has been called into question once he got in there with someone who could actually like have a had a pulse and wanted to try in his last outing and so much so that Berlanga tried to bite him but man what a nothing highlights that how important a record is more than that Berlanga who you're fighting is important and and not just uh, how many wins and you know before that zero who who did you beat what did you learn and that's the key. Ramirez lost a fight to a tough guy. He learned something. Um, is that more beneficial than being on defeat? I would say, yeah. At the end of the day, you learned something. You got better. You're more prepared when the time comes, when you're on ESPN, when you're fighting a big... Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, I would say that serves you better. So a lot of those young managers out there, promoters, should think twice about what I'm just saying right here. You know, instead of just building their record up, give them the right fights to get better. Also, you know, I mean, uh, with with Nova, 21 and 0, but you know, he 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 fought the captain of 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 Ken's yacht twice. You know what I mean? I mean, it was a weekend that he, he was, fought my gardener. He fought yeah, my trash man. Yeah, it was the weekend that his that his captain of his yacht was off. All right, because Ken 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 is not, you know, just that harsh harsh. You know, hey, you just gotta. Work. He's got a heart. He gives guys a week off, uh, once a year or weekend, a weekend off. So, listen, in all seriousness. 21 and 0. All right. Again, I think I made the point. Who? Who did you fight? What did you learn? Um, what resistance did you have to prepare you for when you do have real resistance in your life? So, and for the people out there in life, whatever your vocation, whatever your fight is, whatever your journey is, whatever. <laughs> if you are losing once in a while, Don't get down. What did you learn? Because it's going to make it possible for you to win. It is. It's going to make it possible to win because you got to lose to win sometimes. And so look at it that way instead of just being down and digging your loss. Because really at the end of the day, what you gained, what you learned, if, if it's the right thing and you look at it the right way and handle the right thing, you didn't really lose. You gained. Because you gained the information, you gained the confidence, you gained the experience, the knowledge that you're going to need to win down the road. And that's kind of to Ken's point. That's what Ramirez did. In his first fight, he loses. But he gained. It made him more determined. It made him more aware of that it that, uh, wasn't a walk in the park, uh, that he had to get better. <laughs> he had to pay attention. He had to be on his P's and Q's. He had to be at his best. And... I would. I think that it was the perfect fight for me to make that point we just made. And Ramirez was a southpaw, two-time gold medal, Olympic gold medal, as Ken said. Just like the great Lomachenko, there's not too many guys out there with two Olympic gold medals from the famous uh, national Cuban team that puts out the best amateurs in the world with their program. So... Uh, it was a tough time for the 21 and 0 fighter prospect to fight a 9 and 1 guy with that kind of pedigree when he wasn't he didn't have what he needed to maybe really be ready for that or maybe just was never going to be good enough um but if you listened or followed my tweets Ken uh you could have made a couple extra bucks. You could have went to my bookie and maybe put in a wager with, uh, do they allow wages? I know they do in other sports where during the contest you can make a bet. Live betting, yeah, definitely. Live betting. I know the, U- I know, I know the UFC does, and I'm pretty confident boxing does as well. 
Well, if you did that, if you were watching, follow my tweets, which Rob was putting up, you would have possibly made a little extra money for uh, a nice Father's Day gift for yourself. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many guys buy Father's Day gifts for themselves, but I'm sure there's some out there. I'm sure there's a few. I think I know a few. They work for ESPN. But anyway, um, <laughs> okay, all right. So I would just say that I, about three rounds before it happened, I put out a tweet, Ramirez is going to knock out Nova. Now, Nova won the first early rounds because he was using his height. You know, he was using his reach. He was boxing on the outside. But I could see that once Ramirez found the key to get close, to close the gap the right way, it was going to be over. It was uh, two different styles. One guy, two different physical shapes, physical bodies. Uh, Ramirez stocky, stronger. Uh, Nova, thin, uh, longer, not as physical. And again, he had to live on the outside, Nova, Ramirez wanted to live on the inside. I just knew that once he figured out, to me it was like watching one of those superintendents um, that used to run the buildings back in the day and they had those giant brass key rings, Ken, with a, <laughs> with a thousand keys on them and they knew, <laughs> they knew what door each key was for. And they would they come to a door, they had to unlock the door and they would, they would use that key to unlock. Once he found the right key, once Ramirez found the right key to get in, and he got some help because Nova wasn't fighting a perfect fight for a tall, thinner guy. He was, he was sometimes engaging too close, punching from too close, making opening the door a little bit uh, for Ramirez. But I just knew once Ramirez figured out how to close the gap, uh, it was going to be over. And you know what? I hit that one right because sure enough, three rounds later, bang. Uh, it's over. And the knockout is worth, I asked Rob to put it up, so I'm sure it's probably going to be up there with my tweet that I put up that night. But the knockout was, uh, again, it was boxing 101. It was the sweet science. It was, it was the right way to do it. Uh, he, he's a southpaw. What does he do? He's fighting over who's on the outside. He throws a throwaway punch with the right hook. Throwaway punch. Just as a distraction, Ken, to get to be able to catch him with the left hand, the power punch from the southpaw. So what does he do? Simultaneously, he throws the right hook as a throwaway to, to force Nova back and to distract him. And then at the same time, simultaneously, he steps into that gap beautifully with the straight left and scores the knockout. Beautifully done. The opposite, but it's still sweet science, of what... Tank Davis did, who's a, who's on my top 10 pound for pound list, uh, when he knocked out Romero a couple weeks ago, where he, he enticed him to come in. He enticed him. He set a trap. He stepped back. He enticed him to come in, and he caught him with that left hand from the southpaw position. Well, Ramirez, also a southpaw, he did it in a forward way, in an aggressive way. He threw the throwaway punch, got him to step back what he wanted him to do and got him to look at the hook and then he stepped in with the straight left hand and uh it was all over good job good job by Ramirez and um you know the end of the undefeated record for Mr. Nova yep well that brings us to the main event <clears throat> And uh, better be have li lived up to all the expectations. Kind of bittersweet because you love Joe Smith. There's nothing not to like about him. Never been knocked down. He made up for it in this fight. I think better be have knocked him down three or four times. Just had him right from the jump. It looked like Joe's strategy maybe was to come out and just be super aggressive. He knew he had a big. He knew he had a superior boxer in front of him. He had 300 amateur fights, as you would point out. And he probably knew good and well that he wasn't going to win a boxing match with them. This is what I saw. And it looked like Smith just got on the offensive right from the jump. And I, I don't think it was halfway through the first round where it looked like Smith just started to slow down dramatically. I think Better BF hit him with some good body shots. And it was really the beginning of the end. Once Better BF, who like I think typically starts a little bit slower... Once Smith started pressing him, it kind of jump-started better Biev's motor, and the next thing you know, it was like wound up, and it wasn't stopping. He just beat Smith up for a round plus, for half a round in the first and then finished him in the second. Just 
just awesome, awesome performance from uh, Better BF. Um, how'd you like it? You know what I got out of it, Ken? I, I got out of a, a reminder of my mentor, Customato, the late great boxing guru, manager, trainer, genius, and there's others, but he's mine. And um, so I'll talk about him. It reminded me of something he used to drum into my head as an 18-year-old fighter and then a young trainer after that. I And I spent seven years with him and learning, you know, the the sweet science in him and the psychology of it and putting it to putting it to actual uh, practice. But he would always say, Teddy, it's a prerequisite in our business to be tough, right? Yeah, of course it is. But some, when you got two, and there's degrees of toughness, no doubt about it. But when you get two tough guys, and you had two tough guys here, no doubt about it, Smith's a tough guy, and of course, better be of a tough guy. When you get two tough guys in the ring together, and one is smarter, one is more developed technically, one has a better boxing IQ, if you will, then that guy automatically becomes twice as tough. And it's so true. It's so true. And that's what I got out of it, that better be if was smarter. He wasn't just showing his toughness. He was, he was showing that his experience of the 300 fights you mentioned in the amateurs, where he was a world amateur boxing champion and everything, all the other accolades that he, that he, that he has. Um, he, was, he was showing that, that he does have more than that dimension to him. He was showing that he can box, he can be smart. And that was the difference. That's what separated him. Because he moved a little bit. Uh, he didn't just come forward. Smith came forward. <laughs> he moved. And you know when he was moving, what he reminded me of? One of those AWACS biplanes, Ken, with that big sort of like satellite uh, flying source on top where they used to, we used to see pictures where they would take pictures during the war, before the war, whatever. They would take aerial pictures <laughs> from the sky of whatever... The, our enemy and see where the silos were, see where the enemy was, you know, see where the all the stuff was that the infantry, whatever, or the you know, whatever they had to see from the sky, so then they could make their plans how to attack it. That's what he reminded me of, where he was moving around letting Smith come and he was taking pictures. He was taking spy pictures, taking a look at how Smith was going about this, letting him show him information he would soon use against him. And he, he took those pictures, nice and calm, took the pictures, saw what he had to see, and then he said, okay, now I know where to attack. I know the weak spots now. And one of the weak spots was, yeah, Smith was coming behind the jab, but the jab, and I always teach this in the gym, the jab... It's a great weapon, but it can be a dangerous weapon for you using it. If you don't know how to use it right, it has to be understood where to use it, what position to throw it from, what distance. If you throw it from the wrong position, the wrong distance, you leave yourself open for a counter right hand over it. He threw, Smith was thrown from a little too close, too aggressive, recklessly aggressive. And that's where better be of, saw the weakness he un he saw that and once he saw that he started to counter right hands over that jab from too close and catch him high in the head wherever and affect him hurt him and that's where it started going and unraveling going down the hill for smith and again it was the patience the professionalism the experience the iq you know not just the toughness not just the toughness. It was, it was. You know, you got a, two good pictures of him up there behind you, Ken, and the one on the the one on my left. That one wasn't necessary uh, for this fight. Yeah, the one there with the blood. He didn't. He didn't need to bleed. When he when he has to bleed, he'll bleed because he is that guy. 
He's a warrior. He's a samurai, just like the UFC guy. He's a fighter. He knows how to behave like a fighter, not just fight like a fighter. And so does Smith. Uh, does, so does Joe Smith. But different levels. This time he didn't have to bleed. Different levels, different class. And it, it quickly became very evident the difference of levels in his business, how dramatic it can be. And so he picked the spots with right hands. He heard them. You know, the funny thing, I got to throw this in. I love better. I mean, I have all the respect for better be if in the world. Uh, he beat my guy. I, I don't think this is wrong to say he beat my guy, uh, Alex Volzik. But you know what? Volzik gave him the toughest fight to date. He had the right He plan. was ahead on the cards. He was ahead on the cards going when he got stopped. Tent. Going into the tent. We just couldn't get to the finish line. But I listen, yep. you got to get to the finish line. I get it. But I'm just saying we had the right fight plan. But... We just didn't get to the finish line. But in, in, this, in this fight, he, again, he, he showed why he's undefeated, unified champion. The one belt he don't have now is Beevil's belt. Um, WBA. But, yeah, the WBA. But he, he, was, he was, as I said, he was able to take those pictures, see what he had to see, and then go about his business. And he did it the way he always does it, with his demeanor, no nonsense. He reminds me of Marvin Hagler. In a way, I know Hagler was a southpaw and a middleweight, but in a way that Hagler was all business. You know, he brought a lunch pail. He was a blue-collar fighter with great talent. I get it. Uh, just like Better Beef has great talent. But a blue-collar approach where it was just about getting the job done. No frills. No frills. Get the job done. You know, no extra this or that. Get the job done. That's Better Beef. That's, that's Better Beef. Get the job done. No nonsense. No frills. And he's a Terminator. Terminators are smart. They're not just destructive. You know, you watch Arnold Schwarzenegger in the first Terminator where those laser eyes, what do they do? They break down all the weaknesses of what's in front of him, of his opponent. That's smart. That's efficient. And that's what Better Be of does. He, with his laser eyes, his, his Terminator-like approach, he breaks down all the weaknesses. He sees them. And then he goes and he exploits them. And you touched on it earlier. He mixed it to the body at the right time to freeze him a little bit. Back to the head. He hurt him in the first round. He comes out for the second round. He finishes him. Nice and calm. Nice and calm. Destructive. All business. Matter of fact, I tweeted, I think, to Rob put it up. Do you remember that band... Uh, what was it called? Can Bach and Turner Overdrive? Uh, uh, it, it, they had a hit song, Taking Care of Business. You remember that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I remember the song. That should be his entry song into the... That should be his entry song into the <laughs> ring. I'm going to make it his entry song for us, at least. All right, guys. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Athletic Greens. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Ten free travel packs with your first purchase. As you know, these guys have been with us for a long time. I love this stuff. I take it with me everywhere I travel. I take it every day when I'm at home as well. These guys spent 10 years working with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's got 75 whole food source ingredients, vitamins, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics. It's got everything. It's like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity. All you need to stay on top of your supplement game, Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Join the revolution. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends at Wallaco, Way of Life Athletic Clothing Company, started by our friend Terry White, super division one athlete, uh, created a pair of shorts that could accommodate your needs when you're traveling or when you're in the city. You, it comes with a waterproof, patented waterproof phone pocket, a pocket for your keys. These shorts have everything. They're the ultimate workout shorts, excellent for runs, 
excellent for lifting weights, CrossFit, whatever your workout of choice is, Wallaco is the way to go. Check them out at wallaco.com. Use the promo code ATLAS for 20% off your purchase. Today's episode is also brought to you by our friends at Botanic Tonic, Botanic Tonics, maker of makers of Feel Free. Check them out, botanictonics.com. Use the promo code ATLAS for 40% off, 40% off your purchase. This feel-free stuff is incredible. It creates almost like a euphoric feel and a kava-based uh, botanical uh, herbal tonic. I love this stuff. I take it before runs. I especially take it before big races. It calms me down, but still keeps me energized. I love this stuff. Feel free by Botanic Tonics. Check them out. Use the promo code ATLAS for 40% off your purchase. Taking care of business. Bark and turn overdrive. Because that's all it's about. I, I've, I, when I was watching it, I heard the boos when he was coming in the ring. Madison Square Garden had a lot of fans. Uh, the union, you know, the union brothers of Joe. Laborers Union. Laborers Union. Joe Smith, he's from Long Island, New York, so he, he was a hometown fighter. Of course, Better Be of lives in, in Canada. Uh, and so I, was, I remember tweeting, Better Be of could give to you know what. <laughs> about the booze. Uh, he could give two you know what about where he's fighting. For him, it's just, all right, ring the bell and let me go do what I do. Let me go fight. Let me go destroy. Let me go terminate. And that's that's what I took from it. He reminded me a little bit with his punches being so compact um, and, and accurate uh, and powerful. He reminded me a little, in, in a way, the great Japanese world champion where his punches are compact, short, destructive, accurate. The only difference would better be if, and again, I have all the respect in the world, but he'll chop with that right hand if he has to, which he did in spots. He threw a few chops in there in a couple spots. Um, but... He don't care where he hits you. If he has hit you behind the head, that's up to the ref. But he, he, <laughs> he, he, he's not worried about the Marcus of Queensberry, all right? He, he's a fighter. And, and uh, he, he, I know with Alex, we got hit a couple behind the head. <laughs> and, and, you know, hit Chuck a couple wherever. They happen to hit you behind the head again. Uh, you're in the ring. Uh, protect yourself at all times and hope the referee uh, maybe maybe warns him for some of those behind the head punches. But uh, he didn't win because of that. He won because of the punches in front of the face uh, and to the body. But it, that also reminded me a little of the late, great Rocky Marciano. That son of a gun could punch. Uh, the only undefeated to retire, undefeated heavyweight champ of the world, 49-0. and 0. And he... He didn't care where he hit you. You know, he hit you here, there, arms, maybe a, maybe, you know, take a kidney out. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, hit, hit you. <laughs> Poor Archie Moore. Poor Archie Moore. Watch that fight. See how many shots he got hit behind the head. But look, at the end of the day, I point everything out the best I can for the fans out there um, and give them a little visit in the history uh, lanes, if you will. Uh, when I think it's appropriate, down down memory lane, history lane, but I uh, really impressive. Again, different level, different class. It reminds me also a little bit about Super Bowls, where you know they sometimes they hype up a Super Bowl that it's going to be a great, 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 great Super Bowl, and we all thought because of the styles of this fight, it would be a great fight. We did. And and rightfully, you know, we thought that it would be because of the start. And sometimes the Super Bowls, they become just not what we thought they were going to be. They become one-sided routes. Kind of like the San Francisco 49ers way back in the 80s when they played the New England Patriots. You remember that one, Ken? I don't know if you remember that one. <laughs> that, was, that, <laughs> that was, you know what the Bostonians like Ken call that? They call that, they call that 1980 or whatever years it was, 1980 A, uh, 1980 B, B, not B, C, B, B, 
before Brady. <laughs> before <laughs> right. Brady. Different world. Different world. Yep. But it was it did turn out to be a blowout. Not in the Super Bowl, but in Madison Square Garden. Uh Give credit to Joe Smith. He got there. He won the world title. He got there. Uh, I'm glad a guy like him gets to make money. He made money. His people did a good job, all of them, uh, getting him. His promoter, Joe DeGuardia, his trainers, Copa Bianco, they did a good job, I want to say that, to get him there. But again, give credit to Better BF. Uh, you know, he's he's... He's a different level. And he showed again, more than just the beast mode, more than just the beast mode, he showed how smart he is. He showed that he could adapt and use that, show that dimension, which which he did. Um, him and Bevel, I want to see him and Bevel. I mean, that would, or him and Canelo, or, or him and Canelo. I don't think Hold Canelo on. wants this to was see him. Be- this was going to be my next question to you. Actually, two questions. Number one, where do you put Better Bev on the uh, pound for pound list? And number two, who wins Better Bev Bevel? Good question. Two questions. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not being a Monday morning quarterback. I already got him on my top ten list. I, I don't know where, but wherever it is, I might move him up one notch or something. But not too many because he beat a guy that he's better than. He beat a guy who's available. A good, tough, good puncher, strong guy. But he did beat a guy made to order a little bit, a little bit. So I'm not going to boost him up to it. But he's already on that great list. He's already on that special list. So um, I would, and as far as him and Bevel, I would pick Bevel to win. I would, I know, but I would pick Bevo to win right now because I think Bevo has the style, the the pedigree to match, the amateur pedigree to match better BF with all the amateur fights. Uh, that that pedigree is, you know, that you need that pedigree. That I think he has that, or it helps at least. I uh, Bevo's got that pedigree, the amateur background. He's got the style. He's got the mentality. He showed that against Canelo. I think he's got the style to fight the kind of fight you have to fight with better be of smart on the outside, consistent, uh, disciplined, can't make mistakes. Uh, I think he, I think he could outbox him, but it would be, it would be very, it'd be very interesting to see. And you know what? I, I'd like to go into history, right? We just talked about that. I'm going to throw a fight at you, Ken, for the great fans out there, uh, that it reminds me of. Where it never happened, but it's a fight that I would have loved it to happen. I think fans would have liked it to happen. It would have been very interesting. If a young Roberto Duran fought a young Pinnell Whitaker, it reminds me of that because... Duran would represent better BF, you know, ferocious, strong, good puncher, aggressive when he has, you know, for the most part, all of that. But also the dimension of high IQ that people forget about sometimes, that Duran was smart, very smart too, just like better BF showed he can be. But he was, for the most part, the more aggressive, physical, better puncher. And Pinnell Whitaker, a scientist, like a Mayweather, a scientist, defensive whiz, uh, knew how to counter punch, knew how to box, knew how to knew how to do, and had the amateur pedigree uh, Olympic gold medalist, you know? So I think that comes to mind. A young, and I would have loved to see that fight. I would have loved to see the offense, the destructive mentality, if you will, and, and power, of a young Duran versus the wizardry, the the magic of Pinnell Whitaker defensively, counterpunching, you know, strategy. I would have loved to see who comes out on top in that one. It, it really would have been interesting. That's how I look at this one. I, I know it's different weight classes, but... That's how lightweights, you know, junior, well, whatever, well, to, but compared to light heavies. But that's what I look at. And it would be very interesting 
to see that fight. And again, it would also be interesting, it's not going to happen, if Canelo fought better BF because now you're talking about a different style than the style that Bevo brought into the ring to beat him. Not just how box him, but where better BF could hurt you. Better BF could put the, you know, we, uh, we just talked about, you talked about the Chrissy Martin interview coming up. Uh, she talked about it by saying, we're in the hurt business. You know, at the end of the day, we're in the hurt business in boxing. And Better Beef knows how to put the hurt on you. And he would try to put that hurt on Canelo if that fight ever made. But again, uh, great job. Great job by Better Beef. I know a lot of fans there that were Joe Smith fans were disappointed. But again, congratulations, kudos to him and his team to get there, to fight for a world title. Uh, you know, uh, laborer, uh, the union, uh, the laborers union, right? Uh, a, a son of that uh, fights, a world champion fights in Madison Square Garden. You know, makes a lot of money. Uh, good for him. Uh, I had to give a chuckle, and uh, I, I, I never want to be disrespectful to anyone, but Anthony Yard saying after the fight that he thought better be of was slow, and he wants him like. Uh, Anthony, big fan, but you got knocked out by a jab from a thousand-year-old Kovalev. You do not want to be in a fight with Better Beav. I get that you want the payday, but like you just said, Teddy, there's levels to it. And I like Anthony Yard. He's a good-looking kid. He's strong. He, 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 this would be a complete and one-way beatdown. Um, I hope they don't make that. I hope they try to get the Bevo fight, but I have zero confidence in that fight getting made because one promoter out of the two is going to lose all of the belts. So either either Bevo's promoter is going to walk away with all the belts. Is, is he with? I know he's on the zone. Is he with the, with Eddie Hearn as a promoter? Uh, Bevo. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if it's fight to fight deal, you know, um, or you know couple of fights i don't know if he's close to being a free agent or has uh now maybe become one um uh, it, i don't know what he had to agree to f to get the canelo fight to fight the golden goose even though he was the champ but still the guy he probably made more in that fight than he made in his entire career yeah, no, you're you're right. He he's fighting a golden goose, even though he's the champ. Uh, you know, Canelo didn't bring a title to the ring, but he brought you know he brought the money, uh, obviously. So uh, I I know he's with Eddie Hearn, Bevo. Uh, I would assume he's still with him, but I don't know. Again, I don't know if that was a couple fights left on a contract, fight to fight. I don't know, but I'm I'm sure match room is probably still. I would think is still there, uh, with uh, with you know with Eddie Hearn. I could be I could be crazy here, but I get the feeling Eddie Hearn just wants to make the big fights, and he like doesn't worry about as much about tomorrow as he does about today. Meaning, I don't think top ranks putting better BF in with anyone that that even has an inkling of chance to beat him anytime soon. Even though you know what was the craziest thing? That fight was in the theater. It wasn't even in the big room at Madison Square Garden. Better Biev is a superstar. It's just that, I mean, thank God. I loved seeing him speak English after the fight. I think that that is a huge plus. Same with Canelo. I think that if you're a fighter of that magnitude, if it were me, it has nothing to do with ethnicity, race, religion, or anything else. Speak English to the bigger audience. There's a big audience if you could speak English. Same thing for Usyk. I said it to him personally when, it, when we were chatting at the garden at the Joshua Ruiz fight is there's so many people want to hear from you. If you can speak English, you're so much more marketable just from a business standpoint, nothing else. Um, so I like seeing Better Be of Speak English. It sucks seeing him fight at the, at the theater. Those two guys I thought could have sold out the big room. But nevertheless, I just, I, I, I'd love to see that fight. I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're miles away from it, unfortunately. And that's really the only fight at late heavy that anyone wants to see. Yeah, unfortunately, the politics of boxing keeps the best fights from being happen from happening. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's that simple, you know. It's that simple. Uh, quite often, keeps the best. And if they do happen out of necessity, because the money eventually is so big, so big that the promoters have to go across the street and do business with the other guy, it happens too late. Like Pacquiao yeah. and Mayweather, five years yeah. too late. Not competitive. Uh, I think I saw. 
I think I saw a quote somewhere. Better be of saying if he had to, he'd move up to heavyweight to get a big fight. I don't know who else is going to fight him in light heavy. I mean, aside from Bevel, it's what's the even the sense? I mean, Joe Smith is a world champion, and he dispatched him like he shouldn't have even been in the ring with him. So I don't know what I don't know what Better B F does from here. You don't want to see him massacre someone else. To go back on your t- talking and touching on Anthony Yardi, um, you know, saying what he said, I have to laugh a little bit at what he said because you know he talked about Better B F slow. And last I watched Yarde, he wasn't a speed demon. You know what I mean? He wasn't exact. He wasn't exactly, um, you know. I'm trying to remember the my son, my grandson watches, and I watch him with him. He watches all these different um, superheroes, and you know, all these different um, cartoon characters, and whatever it comes up. I'm trying to remember the guy that he's been watching. He loves him lately. It's the guy that's real fast. Oh, uh, Sonic! 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 There and. Uh, this this Yarde's not Sonic. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he, he wouldn't make you think of Sonic. Um, he, he was kind of slow, one-dimensional, predictable, very strong, good punch if he hits you. But, um, but come on. I mean, not Sonic. Joe, Smith, Joe Smith's a good puncher too, and had never been down and was a world champion, and we saw what happened to him. I, listen, I get Yarde, you want the fight, cool, but at least speak the truth. Don't say that the guy's slow because he's anything but slow. Just say you're going to beat him if that's the case. But, I mean, it'd be like saying, oh, better be if can't punch for shit, I'll kill him. Like, mm, that's maybe you think you can beat him. I don't believe you, but saying he can't punch or he's slow is is oh, maniacal it's, you know, and there's we, and there's assets that are just as important they sometimes more than speed <laughs> or, or power sometimes which like better be of times you oh yeah he throws the right punches he's calm enough to choose the right like he's a terminator he chooses the right punches at the right time he throws them at the right time he times you that can negate speed you know i'm not saying I'm not saying he's got the, you know, hand speed of Bevo or of you know, uh, or the hand speed of obviously a smaller guy like you know Mayweather. Or I'm not saying that, but he's not slow. Yarde might be slow. <laughs> he actually, <laughs> <laughs> he he better watch some video of himself, um, maybe to look at really what he's doing there and what he's talking about and where maybe he needs to work on a couple of things in that department. The last thing I want to add, when I was making uh, I was making that statement about how Customato always said you get two co- tough guys in a ring and one is smart, smarter than the other, he becomes the tougher guy. A great example of that for you great fight fans out there, if you want to Google it, would be go back to one of my favorite fighters, actually, back in the 70s. And the fight I'm going to, reference was in the 1980 i believe but danny little red lopez was one of my favorite he came from an uh, i i think he came from an orphanage on an indian reservation grew up with nothing he used to eat sugar sandwiches uh <laughs> he's a great story and he was i think like, my, i think my kids would actually prefer to have a sugar sandwich yeah, well yeah <laughs> but this this was to kill the appetite so because there was nothing yeah. else to eat but no, i know what you mean no and and he he was one of my favorite punch uh, fighters, and he was a world champion for a pretty long time. And he was a tough guy; he had a good straight right hand. He wasn't the hardest guy to hit in the world, like the great Mickey Duff. See, I I give credit to people <laughs> to, to that reference where I get the reference from or the quote from. I actually give I think it's the proper thing to do. I think it's polite. Um, to give credit to the person that you heard that from or you learned that from. And Mickey Duff used to say, Teddy, it's harder to miss this guy than to hit him. <laughs> or, or sometimes he would say, Teddy, this fella gets insulted if you miss him. And Teddy <laughs> Little Red Lopez had a great chin, great heart, uh, and he was a great right-hand puncher. He was a featherweight champ, kept the title for a while, and he was great. But... Then he fought a guy named Salvador Sanchez, who I think is one of the greatest Mexicans. It turned out later on before his career was over and cut too short because of a fatal uh, fatal car car crash. I thought, you know, the fight 
when he fought Salvador Sanchez, that was the prime example of what Cus was talking about. Two guys, both tough, in the ring, but one guy smarter. And that was Sanchez. And when that happens, the smarter guy becomes the tougher guy, and it's usually no contest. And that fight with Indian Danny Little Red Lopez, they call him Indian Red sometimes, but that fight was with him and Sanchez, it turned out to be no contest. With the Again, my favorite, the great Danny Lopez, um, because the other guy was just too smart, too clever, too developed in those areas. And again, the same example, the same Exhibit A that was on display in Madison Square Garden the other night between two tough guys, better be of and Smith, but one was more developed, one was smarter in a boxing way. And it turned out to be, like Sanchez and Lopez, no contest. Yep. Uh, either way, congratulations, Arter, Be- Arter, Arter Better Biev. Uh, curious to see what's next for him. Let's jump into the UFC. Holy cow, what a card. I think that there was a streak of, I, I don't even know how many first round knockouts. Let me see if I can look at it quickly. But if it seemed like <laughs> DC and the um, the commentary crew was constantly, <laughs> I love watching them scramble when there's like three or four first round knockouts in a row. Uh, let me see. The fight started. First round knockout. Second round knockout. First round knockout. Then you had a split decision women's fight. First round knockout. First round knockout. Third round knockout. Those were all just the prelims. Then in the main event, first round knockout. First round knockout. Round three knockout. Round two knockout. And round two submission. And then, of course, we had the decision, at, um, a split decision. A split decision, razor thin in the uh, main event. But, geez. How's that for exciting? I mean, my God, these fights are unbelievable. If you like knockouts and you like fighting, I don't know how you can't be a huge fan of the UFC, but let's talk about the co-main and the main. In the co-main, Kevin Holland and Tim Means. Um, man, Kevin Holland's always entertaining. He talks crap the whole time, but he's su- he seems like such a nice guy. They're talking to each other. not Intelligent guy, too. He, yeah, to, not derogatory. Just talking to him, like telling him, oh, you missed a shot there. Oh, I got you with that shot. And then afterwards, they're patting each other on the back, like, up, oh, great rounds, and right back to the corners. And finally, Kevin Holland catches him in a, uh, a, a maybe an anaconda choke, but he catches him in a... Uh, in a choke, oh no, sorry, a Dars choke and chokes him out in the second round, uh, 128 into the second round. How'd you like that one? That was an entertaining fight. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to start with this. Uh, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback off of something you just said, where uh, you touched on, and I'll go a little further with it. The respect, the, the nice that he showed at the end of the day, he's a decent guy. You know, yeah, he talks and all that stuff. That's part of the business, part of making money, part of getting your name up there. We're talking about Holland, of course. But he, the only thing that impressed me more than what he did in the octagon that night, and he impressed me a lot, and I'll I'll, I'll get on it a little more in a second. But the thing that impressed me even more was how just his sportsmanship and the mutual respect that these two fighters, and it's not new in the UFC, and we see it in boxing. We see it with these gladiators. The mutual respect that they showed each other, and Holland, the winner who dominated the fight, showed and gave to means. That was impressive, and it always is. It really always is to me. You know, they're, they're in there like animals, you know, and they are, they're savages, but then they're gentlemen, then they're respectful. Uh, that that was, I'm glad you said that because I had to, That that's, for me, that caught my eye even more than his talent. And his talent, the talent of Holland, the Southpaw, uh, an orthodox fighter fighting a Southpaw, means was a Southpaw. The talent of him was really on display. It really was. And his intellect, because... Up against the Southpaw when they were striking against Means, he chose the right artillery. He chose the right weapon. 
the straight right hand to southpaw killer against southpaws often. And he threw it like he threw it like a English brothers and sisters across the pond. I haven't talked to you guys for a while. Uh, throw the darts. Nice. Sit- <laughs> I love those guys, Ken. I do. I miss them. I love them. I am. I, I. I love them. I. I'm. I'm glad they haven't made me eat any crumpets lately. <laughs> but I miss them. I know they listen, and I want them to know I never forget about them. And Holland threw that right hand like a dart. And he hit the bullseye straight down the middle. Look, Means helped him a little bit because Means was like a dartboard. He didn't move his head too much. You know, he kind of stood a little, you know, a little too straight. But beautiful straight right hand, beautiful choice of the right weapon at the right time against the southpaw. He deployed it beautifully. And then he showed his dimension, his his awesome ability not just striking and his power but his ability to go to the mat and finish it by submitting him as you just said uh submitting means on the mat he's he showed he showed the whole package that he's got all the dimensions and he was very i mean with that versatility for me he was very impressive uh he really was. He he was very impressive. I like him. Yeah, good. Kevin Holland seems like a really nice guy. Would be a fun guy to have on the show someday. He's never short on uh And you know what, Ken? Yeah, he would be. And you know why I think they're so respectful? People are probably thinking that right now, and I just caught myself. Teddy, why are they so respectful to each other when two seconds earlier they were trying to dismantle each other? Because they know where they've been. They know the risk. They know the dark place that they've journeyed into. And not too many people have the wherewithal, really, mentally, physically, emotionally, to journey into those dark places. They don't. And so the mutual respect is born from that, where they just basically saying, I know where you were. I know where we were. I know what it took to go there. I know how scary it is to go there, how risky it is to go there. And they're basically saying, you're my brother. Yeah, we went there to destroy each other, so to speak, but we also went there to find out about each other. And we're better for it. We're better for it. And for that challenge, for that you know, exploration of ourselves, if you will. And I think that's what it is. I really do. That they're just, they know what they've been through and they know what it takes. So how can you not have admiration for the man who went there with you? So that's that's where that comes from for me. And um, it's beautiful to see. It never gets old for me, Ken. It never gets old for me when I see that. It makes me, sometimes it makes me a little, I don't know. A little Sentimental. Ups- yeah, it does. And, and even a little upset that I say, why can't other people be that respectful? Why can't we all be that respectful to each other? Uh, you know? Or do you really have to go to, you know, to the edge of the cliff? Do you really have to go, you know, to a dark place uh, to find respect for each other? Can can we as human beings find it in other ways without that sometimes? There's no better example than politics and uh, media coverage of politics. I don't care if it's CNN covering Republicans or Fox covering Democrats. The, the, the vitriol and the hatred and the nastiness is like next level. It's almost like these people, people don't realize that these, these outlets are, are there for, they're, they're for profit businesses. The more they can keep you hating the opposition, the more you're going to keep tuning in. But it's to the point now where it's just disgusting. We're at, we're in crisis mode in the country. Everything is like 
on the bridge of, on the brink of disaster and instead of working together we got people just trying to tear each other down like I don't care what your politics are. The president falls off the bike. The whole, the right, the media on the right thinks it's like the greatest thing thing ever. Trump makes a gaffe. The left thinks that he's a goon. It's just like, come on, man. How about we just have some respect for each other and try to like protect each other. The rest of the world laughing at us, fighting with each other. I don't care what your politics are. If everyone would just take a deep breath and, and before with this knee-jerk reaction, trying to dump on each other. Yeah, some of the stuff is funny, but it's also like whoever's serving as the president there's just like no more respect for the office anyway i digress no but, no um, you don't digress you 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 took from you picked up from where i left off and and you're right it's worth saying listen when we started this and when i started this podcast i remember you asked me on the first episode teddy what do you envision for this podcast obviously we're going to talk about fights what do you envision i said ken life is a fight and what I envision, what I hope for, if I can do anything worthwhile, not only educate people on boxing and on, you know, the different, obviously what goes on in these combat sports and what it's really about, the science of it, you know, to how to appreciate what these warriors are doing in the subtleties, the subtleties of the sport and the, and the, the mental domain of this sport. But besides that, I... Remember saying to you, being that life is a fight, I hope to connect the dots in life to everybody's fight out there. To, to use boxing and now the MMA to connect those dots. And I think it's important. And that's what I, I try to do every show we do a little bit if we can. And so I'm glad you went a little further with it. And I... I would just finish by saying, you remember in school when we were learning math and <laughs> and we, you know, we learn the simple things starting with addition, right? And then we get more complicated, you know, subtraction, division, all that stuff. That's when I started and, to tune out. <laughs> well, that's when I dropped out. Uh, <laughs> now you come on you went to calculus let's be honest yeah. and god bless you but um no and when i think of that in those simple terms where we should get back to school back to our roots back to addition not subtraction to division to to addition not division we don't need to divide. We don't need to subtract. We need to add. That's bring it back. It's, it's in our roots. It's in our DNA. It's in our memory. Bring it back to addition. No more subtraction. No more freaking division. And cut it out. Whoever, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat or something else, stop the division. Stop it. Stop it. We're destroying ourselves. We need more of a sense of team. If you were in a gym training with someone and someone from another team was talking crap about your guy, the whole team would be like, yo, you talk about one of us, you talk about all of us. We need to do that as Americans. And like when the media is crapping on our, listen, we elected these politicians. They represent the majority of the people in particular in districts or states in the country. It's just like, it's a free for all. Anyone can shit on anyone. There's no accountability. It's like we, as the as citizens, we should all hold everyone accountable. Like, no, don't talk about our guy. It, we, you might not have voted for him, but he's our guy right now until we get another one in there. And you can work towards getting your guy in there. But once the decision has been made, we really need some like camaraderie here because this idea of just tearing down the president whoever he is is stupid we all look like idiots we're all losing and everyone else is laughing at us there's just someone eventually has to stand up and like do say something that's going to bring people together and be like let's just be in this together we need to find a candidate that everyone can you don't have to like them but we got to support them we all have to order this we need we need a real leader and the real leaders for me just like you need certain prerequisites to be a fighter to be a leader Care about everybody. Care about the right things. You know, care about the right things and make them your priority. Just the right, not this, not that, that, that. Right, figure it out. 
doesn't take that long. It's not that complex. What's right? What's right? And give thought and care and love when you can to everybody. That's it. Anyway, get to that Agreed. next star. Uh, Let's get to the main event. Uh, Calvin Cater gets in there, loses a split decision. Boston Zone from Methuen, where Rob's family is from. Our great producer, Rob Moore, Calvin Cater, uh, loses a split decision to uh, the great Josh Emmett. What a fight. To me, you know, the... the uh, the tough part for me is when I hear, when I see your tweets and I hear the commentary and I get that thought in my head, I'm like, oh, no, my, I can't get that out of my brain because it's so right. So nothing I'm going to say here is original, but I think you pointed it out. It looked like Calvin Cater was the better boxer. Josh Emmett was the better puncher. I think Cater was trying to keep him off balance. And then again, one of the other things I heard was Cater's corner telling him exactly what I thought that he should do, which is every time, don't let Josh... Emmett get wound up as soon as you see him getting set keep jabbing him keep him off balance and he tried to do that and and Calvin Cater they told him keep coming forward keep coming forward and he tried to do it and it was just like I, I thought it could have gone either way but in hindsight it looked like Cater was just a little bit too late a little bit a, a little a too little too late in terms of getting Josh off balance and Cater and Josh Emmett did enough to get the win how'd you like the fight I can see that perspective I see it Ken I don't agree with it but that's how close the fight was. Mm -hmm. that, to your point, I thought Cater eked it out. And that's the right word. And, and if Emmett eked it out, that's the right word. But I thought Cater eked it out a little bit, a little bit, similar to the great Volkanowski and the great Max Holloway, where their second fight, they're going to have a third. I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. But their second fight where I thought Holloway pulled it out and he didn't get it i thought it was similar to that and holloway did it <laughs> by boxing but the difference is with holloway is first of all he can go to the mat really good uh you know he's got that versatility he's got that dimension um but the difference with holloway is he sets the table with jab like a boxer and this did look like a fight it looked like a boxing match and Holloway will set the, you know, he has set the table with the jab, but then he'll eat with other punches. You know, he'll put combinations together. That's where Cater might have come up a little short. He set the table all night with a beautiful jab, controlled range. You know, it was obvious that the power belonged to Emmett. The power, the aggression, that's Mr. Emmett. The boxing skills, the jab, the finesse, you know, the legs, <laughs> um, the philosophy in that area, that's that's Cater. That was what it broke down to. And that was going to be, and it was. That was the mantra. That was the consistent theme all night long from both fighters. And again, Cater used that jab really well, but he should have ate. You set the table with the jab, you got to eat then with the right hand at least and other than the fourth round which i thought was an important round because i thought that going into the fourth going in the sea going into the fourth i had it three to one uh no i had it two to one i'm sorry i had it two to one going into the fourth for Emmett and I thought that in the fourth round that Cater won it and even the fight up on my scorecard because he used the jab again like he had been no different but now he ate with the right hand and spots so I thought that earned him an even fight I thought that earned him the the fourth round. And then obviously I had it even going into the fifth. And I thought he I thought he eked it out. Um in the in the fifth. I, I thought that he did. But the judges obviously liked the style of him better. The aggressive power guy versus the boxer. The jab, the finesse, the movement. They obviously like that style. This is where I got a problem, Ken. No matter who you like, no problem. Close fight. 
The criterion shouldn't be played with. That shouldn't be up for debate. That shouldn't be subjective. Where the criterion for striking, just like in boxing, is who lands the cleaner, more effective punches, period. Period. Yes, Emmett owned the harder ones, but he didn't land. He wasn't effective enough, not enough, with those hard punches. I thought that the boxing, the guy who was a little more effective in the boxing area, because that was became a boxing fight, basically, I thought, again, was Kata. But again, I can't really argue. It was close and okay, fine. But... What bothers me is if the judges give it to the guy who just gives them eye candy, the guy who just gives them the, does what they like, what they like more, which is maybe aggression, maybe, you know, throwing hard punches. They need to look closer to see if those hard punches are landing at a rate where they deserve to get the rounds and get the fight. It's not enough just to give it to a guy because you like his style better. You got to give it to a guy who matches the criterion of judging and striking. Who's landing the cleanest, most effective punches. Period. So... Anyway, I again, uh, I love to, you know, early on it was a little boring, both guys, but boring in a way where it's strategic, where it's professional, where it's science, where they're both using their legs, <laughs> controlling range, trying to figure out, you know, the right way to attack without leaving themselves vulnerable. Again, I used that analogy I used earlier in the show, Ken. They're the superintendent with that big brass ring, uh, you know, of the building that has a million keys on it, and they're trying to find the right key to open the door. Uh, that's what they were doing. And that's what Cato was doing, looking for the right key to create offense without giving up defense, without being vulnerable to the hard punching I mean, he was very, I thought Cater was smart. I thought he was controlled. I thought he was patient. Some people say too patient. Hey, I can't argue. Maybe too patient. Maybe that's what cost him getting the fight. Um, but I thought he was very respectful and obviously aware of the power and danger of Emmett. And, um, and that's why he boxed. He used his legs. Again, looking for the right entrance uh, for offense without making himself vulnerable to the power, uh, the, the destructive power of Emmett. Uh, it, it, was an, it was a good close fight. Yeah, great card, top to bottom. Um, one last thing I want to discuss with you before we sign off, and uh, guys, reminder, please stick around for the Christy Martin interview. I promise you, you listen to this and don't like it, call me personally. I want to talk to you because there's no, there, there, this is an unbelievable interview. Um, Usyk, Anthony Joshua announced, I believe, August 20th. I think they're probably doing it in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's got that money. It's crazy what you'll do to, like, get that bad press to go away with Jamal Khashoggi. But they, they got the money. They're going to pay the site fee. Um, and they're going to host this fight. I believe they're going to host it on... Let me just confirm here. Uh, yeah, August 20th. Um, what are you looking for in this one? I'm excited for this. I don't think Anthony Joshua can beat Usyk. I think Usyk has the confidence knowing what he did the first time and uh, gets him and beats him easier the second time. That's my opinion. I would agree with that. But there's an X factor. But I would agree with it at face value, at first blush. Because I've been in this business almost 50 years. And when a guy wins the fight, 
with a guy, you know, and, and Josh was no spring chicken. They're both getting up there, especially Josh. I think, I don't know who's older, but, you know, he's getting up there a little, and he's made a lot of money. You have to put that into the fact that, are you as hungry? Are you as hungry? He's made a lot of money. I don't know if he is. I think that he showed <laughs> the possibility of being influenced in those dimensions when he fought Madison Square Garden and got knocked out by Ruiz. He didn't look like a hungry guy. He didn't. So, and he came back. Give him credit. He came back, got the title, beat Ruiz, <laughs> fought a different style, became a different person, a different physical being for that. Took a lot of weight by off. By the way, Teddy, Teddy, Usyk is 35, AJ 32. Okay, so Usyk's even older. But sometimes you judge age in different ways. Uh, and... For me, Joshua is getting older in a way that I started to touch on, that he might have satisfied himself in certain realms of making money. When you do that, you get old. Yeah, because you get disinterested. I think that's at play a little bit, and I think a guy like Uzik, it's never about money. I think it's about the fight. I think it's about honor, pride, I'm not saying the other guy don't have that, but for Uzik, I think it's about, like better be if, I think it's about honor, pride, legacy. And now there's an X factor. I think it's about his people. That terrible war going on with Russia over in the Ukraine. Of course, Uzik is Ukrainian. He lives there. Um, in some ways, he may attach himself, and I'm sure he will, that he's fighting for the people. He's fighting for the Ukrainian people in some way. Oh, definitely. And yeah, I, I I do, Ken. So I think that's an X factor. Uh, also, as I started to say, usually in these kind of matchups, when one guy, let's say the guy that's the hungrier guy, which I think is Uzik, I think anyway, but he was the underdog going in. and And of course... He not only beat Joshua, he came close to stopping him. He dominated at the end. Close fighting, but then he dominated. It was a chess match a little bit. And then he, you know, a little bit, it was the quickness and the, uh, the cl dimensional ability of Usyk, the cerebralness of Usyk, uh, the determination is always there against the right hand of Joshua. And he was able to avoid the right hand of Joshua that that could always change the fight. He's the bigger man. He's the bigger puncher. Could always change the fight. And he dodged it, and then he hurt him late and came close to stopping him. I, th I think that that will still be in the air, the power of the right hand by Joshua, that that's always an element, that it could change the fight at any time, even if he's losing. It could change the fight quickly power can be a great eraser to make up for a lot of mistakes um but i think that usually these fights when i look at the history as i said 50 years me being in this business usually in the way that i just drew it up the way i just described it when that fighter wins the first fight the, in this case i think the hungrier guy i think in the end uh, he dominated. I think the guy that showed himself to be a better all-around fighter. When that guy wins the first time, he usually wins the second time easier. To your point, you said, I think it went easier. I agree with that. But here's another X factor. On the other side of the ledger, Uzik just went through a life-changing experience. He saw his countrymen die. He saw his country taken apart. He saw things that he's seen since he was a baby destroyed. Buildings, factories, people's lives. He's seen that destroyed with artillery. Not artillery of a left or a right hand. Artillery of bombs, of machine guns, of missiles from the Russian army. That impacts you. I don't care what kind of fighter you are. That impacts you. And... When you've seen that, it puts things into perspective. It puts things where 
How important is anything compared to life? How important is boxing? How important is making millions of dollars? I know it's important, but how important is that compared to your country, to your, your countrymen, to your children, to your future, to the life that you've known? All of a sudden, it becomes minimal. All of a sudden, wow, boxing is not quite as important as it once used to be. And that perspective, as proper as it is, and it is proper, there are things more important than anything we do. Our family, life itself, always more important. But when that perspective strikes home, and it doesn't always, but in this case, because of the war, When you live through that, as Usyk has, and you're touched by that, which Usyk has been, your perspective changes. And as healthy as that perspective is and true it is, it's not healthy for a fighter. It's not healthy for a guy that has to go in that ring, and that has to be the priority. That has to be the priority. Winning your career, uh, some selfishness because it's your career, it's putting yourself, yes, your family, but it's putting yourself first. All of a sudden, being awakened by this experience and having that new perspective, that can be a danger to a fighter where all of a sudden it's not as important. Now it's either going to be that, and that's what makes this the X factor. Very interesting. It's either going to be that or it's going to be he attaches himself to what I said earlier, Ken. I'm fighting for Ukraine. I'm fighting for that flag. I'm fighting for the pride of my country. I'm fighting for the, I'm fighting for the people to give them something of hope, to give them something to help lead them out of the rubble. When they're going to need something, else besides humanitarian help from the Red Cross and from all the good people out there and everything else and their warriors, their soldiers, all of that. But they're going to need something eventually else to lead them out of the rubble. He can become that something, that symbol of hope. So it's going to be one or the other. That's what makes this fight intriguing to me. Because otherwise... I think it's a one-sided fight or potentially a one-sided, except for the, as I said, there's always the power of that right hand that could change things. But at the end of the day, that's how I break the fight down. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it semi-important. And I will go with Usyk again. Very good, and I'm sure the guys at my bookie will uh, have the lineup. I'm sure it's up there already. I don't know off the top of my head, but we will get the line in the coming weeks, and we'll. Uh, I'm sure we'll do a fight plan on this one. And um, with that, you got anything else, Teddy, before we say goodbye? One more time, guys, reminder, please stick around for the Christy Martin interview. I promise you're going to love it. Um, you got anything else, Teddy, before we kick it into um, the Christy Martin interview? No, watch it. <laughs> That's what yep. I can tell you. Do yourselves a favor. Watch it. And with that, please enjoy this interview with the great Christy Martin, coal miner's daughter. Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of boxing, Teddy Atlas, and today's very special guest, the coal miner's daughter, newest Boxing Hall of Fame member, Christy Martin. Christy, how you doing? I'm well. That sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Yeah, yeah it sounds Thank awesome, you. and every bit of it earned. I mean, you know, anybody you would think that gets in the Hall of Fame earns it, but uh, your your past, your record, you really did earn it. I mean, I'm very happy for you. And, Thank uh, you. Really, I, I, you're a pioneer in the sport of women's boxing. You really, truly brought women's boxing, you know, out of the shadows where it was thought of as a circus type, you know, sideshow, quite frankly, back then. And you legitimized the sport. Uh, you, you really did. And you, 
you now have this book, uh, Fighting for Survival, the, you know, your story, you just got into the Hall of Fame. Uh, it's, it's terrific. You deserve all of it. And I just think that your story is really an incredible story. And, you know, the book makes it very clear that you might have started your boxing career around 1989 uh, or so, but you were, you were already fighting basically your whole life. So without any further ado, Christy, introduce the people out there who may not, they may only know you as Christy Martin, you know, the most accomplished and famous woman's boxer of all time. I mean, Layla Ali is up there in that area uh, too, but in that company. But as far as what you've done for the sport, and as I just mentioned, a pioneer of the sport, but for the people out there that don't know your story, introduce them to Christy Salters, uh, as, as Ken said, the coal miner's daughter, and who, who she was and who she is. Well, Teddy, you're right. I, I, I really feel like I've been a fighter all my life. And in the book, Ron, Ron Borges did a great job putting all the words together and making a, a great story, I think, of my life. Um, and the underdog story, Teddy, you know, coal miner's daughter, small town in southern West Virginia where everybody knows everybody. Um, you know, there's my little my little town was one mile long. I mean, the, the next big city, the next so-called city had one traffic light at the time. Now it doesn't even have any. Um, so. You know, you're always fighting. You're Population always of 283, correct? Was that? Population. 283, yes, yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, yes. And at the time, I mean, growing up, so my grandparents, one set of grandparents lived like three houses up from me. The other set of grandparents lived half a mile from me. So, you know, everybody knows everybody, lots of family. So if you get in trouble, everybody knows. Everybody's telling your mom and dad what you do. Some of that's good, Teddy. Some of that's good. Um, but but with that, as we, you know, went through the book and I was a loved sports, but I was also hiding my true sexuality. So with with that and with everybody, such a small town, everybody knowing everybody's business, it was it it, it makes you a, it makes you a, a, a hider, a fighter. You know, you're you're fighting to, to hide. And so that was a big struggle. Uh, you know, when I was very young, when I was about six years old, I had a cousin come from North Carolina, come up to visit us and uh, sexually abuse me. And so so that I kept hidden because I, this is this is at that point, I was too afraid to tell my dad. Uh, I guess I was afraid of what he would do to him. And then I um, then I kept hiding it because I didn't want to cause a rift in my family. And that's been my life. I mean, that's how I am. Like, I always try to make everybody else happy. I know a lot of people that know me as the fighter, the boxer, you know, they think I'm an arrogant ass, but I'm, I'm I might be an ass, but I'm really not that arrogant. Um, and, and, and I tried to look out for other people. And that's what I did. I tried to keep a lot of things secrets, make everybody else happy. And then, uh, then I get married. I get into this relationship with Jim Martin, who was my boxing coach, my trainer, my husband, my drug supplier. And most of all, he was my abuser. And he abused me from day one, really, um, because he told me, I'll kill you if ever you leave me. And that's what I heard for 20 years. And at first, you know, I was young. I was 23 or 24 years old. And you, you kind of laugh it off like hey, nobody's going to kill me. But but somewhere along the line in that 20 years, I realized that, no, that's the way it's going to end. He's going to kill me. And. And I just got to the point in my life after being addicted to cocaine and 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 actually seeing myself in the mirror one night and and thinking, oh, my God, you look like an addict. I like, no, you don't look like an addict. You are an addict. And then at that point, I was like, no, I'm going to I'm going to change. I'm going to change who I am and, and I'm going to leave. And when I, as I left that few days later, he told me, if you leave me, I'll kill you. And I stopped and I turned around. and I looked him straight in his eyes and said, do what you have to do, Jim knowing, knowing that he was going to kill me. There was not a question in my mind he was going to kill me. Well, that's how you, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, the name of the book is Fighting for Survival, the Chrissy Martin, Chrissy Salter story. Uh, it's, you should get it. <laughs> we have, we have 265,000 very loyal subscribers to this show. And I would tell every one of them, 
uh, you should get it because it's a story of of survival. It's a story of living. It's a story of redemption. Um, it's a story of a champion, a true champion. So go right now for the people that are listening, Christy, and now you have them queued up. You have them on the edge of their seats because they want to hear more when you hear, as I said, it, it, it's an incredible story. Uh, it's a movie. And, um, you know, you you hear these things and you just shake your head a little bit uh, when you hear them. But go to that place that you just touched on, it was in the beginning of your book where you describe it where obviously it's a life-changing moment. I think it was just before Thanksgiving, if I'm correct. Yes. Um, the date was November 23rd, 2010. Take us there if you would. I, I know it's tough, but if you would take us there. Yeah, I um, I actually, I... I um. I had driven by my house and I saw Jim was standing out in the driveway with the neighbor. And for some reason in my mind, I was like, nope, I'll go there and fight with him one on one, but I'm not going to go two against one. So I went and I actually told some of my very good friends, I was telling them goodbye. They didn't know that. But I went, I stopped a few places and I was seeing them and and um, and what I was telling them was goodbye. And then. The last thing I did, I made one phone call to a, my best friend at the time. And I was just like, you know what, Donna, uh, I have to go. And she said, please don't go. He's crazy. Don't go there. But I, I had to because, Teddy, I wasn't going to run the rest of my life. You know how I, I, how I was a fighter that I, I'm not going to look over my shoulder for the rest of my life waiting on this guy to come kill me. So he's either going to he's going to get his chance right here. You're either going to kill me and I'm going to be done or I'm going to live through whatever you have to offer. And that's the attitude I went in with. Um, he was at the house and and I told him I have a terrible headache, which I did. I laid down. I thought, you know, as soon as my head stops hurting, I'm going to the gym because I was going to get back in shape and fight again. And um, the whole time I was on the phone with, talking to him, I can hear him sharpening a knife, sharpening a knife. But it was no big deal because he, he did it all the time. He, you know, he, he had knives around. He sharpened a knife. But this time he stood right out in front, right by the bedroom door sharpen a knife, calling people, tell them I was a bitch and I was a lesbian and I was this and I was that. And then finally he came in and I was on the phone putting my shoes on because my head's still hurting, but I'm like, I'm going to go for a run. I'm just going to run until like my head explodes. I don't care. I have to get out of here. And so I putting one shoe on, he's standing in front of me. I'm talking on the phone and, and um, I said, I have to go. He said, I have something I'm going to show you. And me, because I'm, in my, I'm already in the frame of mind, I'm getting back in shape. I'm going to fight again. I thought he had a boxing contract. And he kept putting his hand behind his back, behind his back. And finally, I looked, and I saw he had a knife stuck down in his shorts. And when I saw that knife, I said to him, what are you going to do? Kill me. And it was like instantly, bam, bam, bam. He started stabbing me. And um, he, the, first, the first stabs, I didn't really realize, even though I had seen the knife, I didn't realize that he stabbed me until the fourth one. It went through my breast and then like blood went everywhere. And I'm like, I'm like, you stabbed me. And then, um, then I tried to kick him away from me. When I tried to kick him away from me, he cut my calf muscle almost completely. It was just hanging on my leg. And we fought, we struggled. I tried to get away from him. Um, he, he got me down the floor. He's pistol whipping me. He's banging my head into the, into the dresser. Um, and I told him at that time, I was like, I mean, I don't know. Can we, are we bleeped out? Can I say what I said to him? Yep. I, I said, motherfucker, you cannot kill me. And I meant it just like the sun came up today. And, and, um, you know, he, he, he hit me some more. And finally, uh, I felt a gun in his pocket. And when I felt a gun in his pocket, I'm like, I got to get that gun from him. I got to get the gun, but I couldn't, I wasn't strong enough. So, you know, I'm a West Virginia girl. So I understand if you kick out the clip, eject the clip, you know, I, he would only have one shot at me. So that's what I did. I was able to get the clip out knowing he had one shot, but I was like, well, you got one shot, you know, in my mind, that's it. So he left, he stopped, he stopped beating me up and stuff. And he, he kept walking in and out of the bedroom. And at first I was like, I can hear my lung gurgling. I'm knowing so I'm going to die. I mean, my lungs punctured and, I, I'm like, please, I'm sorry. You know, I tried all this stuff, like being nice. And then I realized 
he can't let me live. He can't let me live because I'm going to tell somebody he did this to me. So then I just, you know, I just told him he's a piece of shit. I've always hated him, da, 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 all those things. And finally, after about 45 minutes or so, he came in, he stood at my feet, he took the gun and I told him, you don't have the balls to shoot me. And he shot me with my own nine millimeter, uh, missed my heart by about three inches. And um, I, I just prayed, you know, I just prayed at that point. I said, God, please show me some way to get out of here. And that's that's what happened. I heard the shower water turn on. And when I heard that water turn on, I knew that was God telling me, get up and get out. And I, I got up. I took my car keys. I uh, took the gun with me, actually. And um, when I got to my I got to my Corvette, I had the wrong keys, had the keys of the other car. And I said, well, I'm not going back in that house. So I went in the middle of the road and basically carjacked somebody. And um, he took me to the hospital. You know, thank goodness we were only about three or four minutes from the hospital. And they uh, they got me stable and life flighted me down to the trauma hospital. So, you know, God has a plan for me, Teddy. I don't know what it is sometimes, but but it's a plan. And I hope it's I, I hope I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I think I'm making a difference. I'm sharing my story. I'm talking to people about domestic violence. I'm talking to people about sexuality, about just being the underdog. No, it does not matter where you're from what your circumstances are dream big my dad used to tell me dream big you know i feel like crying <laughs> it's it's no i'm just saying it's hey listen i shouldn't be crying because it's a story of triumph you know it is a story of triumph in the end i think that it sounds like a victim story but it's not it's a survivor's story it's a winner's story um it's a story of a true fight what do you fight for you know, it doesn't have to be in a ring. Right. What do you fight for? And it's a great story. I hope everybody goes out hearing this from Chris to yourself. I hope everyone goes out and buys this book. It deserves to be read. And um, it, hopefully it can help people. That's how I look at it, that it can help others. For I don't sure. know how you look at it, but I would think you might look at it the same way. Absolutely. And, and you know, I know that you have... Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people listening to you that are a lot of them and the majority, I'm sure, boxing fans. But this this book is uh, it, it, it's not a boxing book, really, as you just said, it, it's it's the boxing is the backdrop. It's got some good boxing stories in there. We talk about Don King. We talk about Mike Tyson. Um, but it's a survival story. It's an underdog story. And it's a to me, it's a it's a fighting story. It's not a boxing fighting story. It's a life fighting story. Keep fighting. And, you you know, only good's going to come. If you just if you lay down, you know, you lay down. There's no need to lay down. Keep fighting. Where is he now? I, I would imagine he's in a penitentiary. But um, well, tell us, if you can, what happened with that as far as the court process. Right. So after we went through the trial, um, he was sentenced because it was in Florida. Thank God. He was sentenced to 25 years, day for day, no time off for good behavior, no nothing. Um, does not matter what happens. He will not get out for 25 years. And at that point, he will be, I think he'll be uh, 92. Even though in my mind, I'm like, that son of a bitch is going to live to be 92. So he has one more shot at me. Um, we'll see. We'll deal with that. But it, so it's been about. When he gets out, you can break his hip for him. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah thank you for uh, that ken I, i'm <laughs> hoping that you know I, and i thought to, to be this is terrible but um i you know i hope he lives 24 years and and uh you know 24 years and 10 months you know <laughs> right there when he's almost <laughs> ready to get out but christy you're a special person um the fans out there they they love you we love you um I want you to now take us to the beginning for all the fight fans out there, the beginning of your boxing career. Um, you had an unbelievable boxing career. Um, how did that start? And take us through some of that, please. Yeah, so in the beginning, it's the craziest thing, Teddy. I was uh, you know, I was in college and and decided I wanted to do this tough man contest because growing up, I'm in southern West Virginia. We don't yeah. have, you know, we don't have any major league sports teams here. We don't even have boxing. We don't I had never been to a live professional boxing match, but I had been to the tough man contest. And for whatever reason I thought this will be the coolest thing. Like like they need to add women to this so I can I can I, I want to enter. 
And uh, I kept telling the promoter, come on, do the women's category, do the women's category. And finally, one year they did. And I'm sure it was probably the first one to sign up and just uh, who fights in the tough man contest. You know, it's those guys that think they are tough and they they're not. (laughs) Uh, And it's the same thing with women. I mean, at least I was an athlete. I was playing basketball. I played basketball through high school. I was playing in college. Uh, So I was an athlete. Uh, but I wasn't a fighter and thank God that Christy Salters never ran into Christy Martin because Christy Martin would beat the shit out of her. I mean, it would have been embarrassing. It would have been terrible. She would have hurt Christy her. Mar- Christy Martin would beat the shit out of most people, period. <laughs> it was, a, it would have been bad, but you know, it's sometimes ig- ig- ignorance is uh what is that? Ignorance is bliss. Or, you know, um, I just had no idea. I had no idea how serious, how serious boxing is. Well, you you were supposed to be the first woman's one million dollar uh, woman's purse. Uh, you were going to fight Lucia Rika for a million dollars was the purse, I believe. And she wound up with an injury. I think it was an Achilles, I'm not sure. But she wound up with an injury before the fight, so the fight never happened. Now take us to that because obviously that I mean that moment that must have meant I mean that's we've talked about a life changing moment before in a different way that's a life changing moment in a positive way that you were on the the verge of can you take us to that and what that meant to you at that moment I mean at that particular moment that was the fight that you know everyone in boxing especially the media guys you know, everybody had talked about Lucia Riker, Lucia Riker, and that I had dodged her. This is what I know. This is what I know for fact. Don King tried his best to sign her to make the fight. If she wanted to fight me, she knew that she had to sign with Don King to make it happen. She would not. She would not sign with him for that one fight. That's it. Uh, had she beaten me, then she would have been the girl. She would have been the one making the money. She would have been the one fighting on all of King's big cards. But she did not. So finally, Bob Arum's going to put the fight together in conjunction with the the uh, release of the DVD for Million Dollar Baby that Lucia Riker was in. Um, one week, I'm about to get on the plane. The day I'm about to get on the plane, I get a call from from Miguel Diaz from Top Rank, and Miguel said, "Fights off." I mean, what what was I supposed to say? I said, Miguel, you're you're kidding me, right? He's crazy. I'm, I'm a business person. I don't I don't joke about things like this, which, of course, he wouldn't. But how, what, what else was I supposed to say? I mean, well, I wasn't just going to say, well, OK, and hang up and, and be done with it. And like, OK, it's a million dollars that I'm in my mind counting on and it's it's gone. And yeah, so I was disappointed. And, but the whole thing is, Teddy, you know, after all those years and all that talk about Christy wouldn't fight Lucia, Christy wouldn't fight Lucia. Christy had signed. Christy was in the best shape of my life. And I wanted the fight so much. I even called her people, Lucia's people, directly a few weeks later. Are we going to reschedule this? I- I'll do it for I- – I- at that point, I didn't care how much money. It was a statement for me. Never, never, never was it even ever talked about again, considered again. Nothing. Shoot, the fight was never talked about. Well, you – I, this is how I feel, but I, I wanted your feelings on this. You sort of paved the path for, well, we already know you're a pioneer in the sport. You paved the path for women to go to other places that you never thought they could go to at that point in your sport. But you paved the path for a future million-dollar payday with women, which just happened not too long ago. Amanda Serrano and Katie Tell, unbelievable fight at Madison Square Garden. They each made in excess of $1 million in that purse. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that, uh, and I think you have, you have, for me, you have the right to feel this way, but how do you feel? Do you feel that you're proud of, being partly responsible to pave the road for that? I, I, I am proud of it. I, you know, I'm just I'm like, dang, I came wrong. I came along too wrong, too early. <laughs> but if I if I had done what I did, then the opportunities for the for these women that are fighting today may not have been there. Uh, because but what a fight, Teddy. I mean, we were we were in second Oof. on the second row. Wow. And, and it was, I, you know, when people 
walked out of the building that night, when people turned their TV off from pay-per-view, there's no one that should have said that was a good woman's fight. It was a good fight. It did good, not matter. Good point. It did not matter. It was a good fight, period. And, good point. Uh, I, and I think those two, I actually text, text my friend Deirdre Gogarty, which their our fight, I think, is the one that really changed the scene for women's boxing. I text her and that night and told her, I think we're number two now. Because, I mean, we took it to our height, but they took it just a little higher. And, and I really, um, you know, we'll see what happens from this point. Is it going to be just about those two? Maybe. Or will there be more women to come along that can, can capture the public, the fight fans' attention, and continue to grow the sport? Ken, you, you take it from here, please. Ask Chrissy whatever you have on your mind, please. Yeah, for sure. First of all, it was nice meeting you at that fight. I don't know if you remember where, that I met you on the way out after that fight. I, I do. Yes, sir. Um, and when I told my wife we were interviewing you today, my wife is like a casual boxing fan and she's aware of the show and kind of like half ass pays attention. When I told her I was talking to you, she her eyes lit up. She's like, oh, my God. Please ask her about when she fought her current wife. Your current wife is Lisa, right? <laughs> yes, and yes. And she said when, when she was going to fight Lisa, she was so mean to her. Did, oh she my know, God. did she know that she had feelings for her at the time? No, 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 clearly See, not. Wait, let I me say that. one thing. Let me say one thing. That's a great question. I knew it didn't come from Ken. I knew it had to, <laughs> I knew it had to come from the lady in his life, the woman in his life, his wife. But great question. Uh, all credit to Ken's wife. Go ahead. So, no, I had never met Lisa, but I. Um, this is the very truth. That was my last fight with Don King. I didn't know it was going to be my last fight with Don King, but it was. And I had. Um, we had had maybe three opponents keep falling out, falling out, falling out. So we're like the week before fight week. And I watched this videotape on Lisa. She's big. She's like, you know, she's tall. I'm short, little shit. She's like five inches taller than me and strong. I mean, so I'm watching the videotape and most of, you know, that back then we didn't have a lot of videotapes. I see her with this beautiful straight right hand, knock this girl out. I'm like, why would I, why do I want to fight her? And they said, well, she's your only option. I'm like, well, <laughs> sign it up. You know, I mean, it, if that's my only choice, that's my only choice. But so on the scales, uh, we make weight and, and she's like put, uh, putting her shorts back on or whatever. And she says, good luck, Martin. And like, but she says it real arrogantly, like, and I'm like, good luck getting knocked the fuck out. Because, you know, that's who I am. And, I, and, and because she's so big and you know how we, we had to do this. I wanted to make her mad, mad. If I get her mad, she's going to make mistakes because when you're angry in that ring, you can't think. And so I'm like trying to play the head game on her. Um, so we had a few little, you know, exchanges. And then even during the fight, I missed her with a big left hook. And she's like, Ooh, they told me you were fast, bitch. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I mean, this went through me like this. She can't talk to me like that. Um, so, yeah, after the, the, the round ended, I think it was the second round. And again, they told me you could punch too, bitch. And Kenny, Kenny Bayless is pushing us back to our corners. And yeah, so we try not to talk, talk about the fight ever. <laughs> I, I, I try to, that's like the last thing I try to talk about. It sounds like uh, it was a match, perfect match, the two years, because uh, she sounds a little bit like uh, Christy Martin. That her she, oh, <laughs> she, 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 she's, um, well, you know what? But Teddy, we're, we're real opposite. Like me, I, I want to just knock you out in the first round. Yeah. I'm going to get the same chick, right? I want to knock you out. I want to hurt you. I, I mean, if you're going in there, I want to, this is the hurt business. I want to hurt you. Lisa just wants to beat people up for 10 rounds, get her chick and go home. I, I, I don't have that mentality. You know, I don't even have that mentality in life, really. I want to be the best. I just, and she wants to be the best too, but she wants to be the best, like, follow the rules. I, I just, <laughs> you know, let's just get there. Let's just do it. Like, Christy, I remember when, when I first saw you fight was the first time, and, and I, I don't mean this offensively towards women boxers, but the first time I saw you fight, I was like, holy shit, that was the first time I said, that girl can fight. Wow, she is like putting it together. It's like now when you see girls in the UFC versus the early days, you're like, wow, I mean, they're like, they, they're as good as the guys, like on a relative basis. They are technically sound. And that's how I remember feeling when I saw you. So congratulations on all the success i've loved watching it i love i love your story and that story you told like teddy said it was hard not to like shed tears listening to that so sad that someone would be so sick 
to like do that to another person and thank God he got what he deserved. So congratulations on all your successes. And, thank you guys. And you know, Christy, a um, couple more for me. I, I can't let you go. I got to keep you here for a minute because, right. uh, because you're special and it's just nice talking to you. You know, we do a lot of interviews. We got David Portnoy coming up next week and we, we, we got all these two, but for me, Honestly, this is one of the nicest, best ones that we've ever done. It really is. It Thank is you. because it's you and because of your story and because of where you are now coming through that dark place that a lot of people never would have got through. They would have um, fallen. Either they would have died or they would have went to drugs or they would have, you know, plenty of excuses would have fit in there to say, and who would have argued with you that, hey, that's enough? But you never said that. And again, that's why I think this is a story to teach people, uh, to help people. My question now is, what was harder, knowing that you've told the story that you've told so far, where people are up to speed on, on Christy Martin, Christy Salters, what was harder, facing your opponent in the ring back then or looking in the mirror? when you were carrying all the stuff you were carrying. I mean, it's enough to get in a ring and face somebody. That's a hell of a tough thing, one of the toughest things in the world. But to get in there when you were hiding so many things, um, what was, well, did you ever think of it that way? Was it harder to get in a ring and fight, which most people would think it is? Or was it harder to look in the mirror and say, who am I? You know what? That's a, that's a great question, Teddy. But I, I, I believe... I really, really, truly believe that the way that I fought, the aggressiveness, the the anger, the the one I hurt that I had, I really do believe that was that was a product of holding everything in and and seeing that person in the mirror and not really knowing how to deal with that person. Because the very, very truth is, the very honest to God's truth is, I had to I tried to have two fights after um, Jim shot me and and all the you know left me for dead. And well, I lost them both. One of them to me is St. John, who we all know can't fight. But I had had a stroke. I, I can give <laughs> but you. But she could pose for Playboy, though. <laughs> but she she could pose for Playboy. She and and um, I really believe that the fight was gone. Like so, so that person that was in that mirror, hiding and holding in the fact that I'm in this terrible uh, domestic violence, not physically abusive often but mentally and emotionally abusive relationship i was holding all that in it made me so angry and i mean in the ring i could be that person though because you can you can you can be that aggressive person in the ring and it's okay but after everything happened and i got to the other side of it it was gone it was gone so that's hopefully that's the answer you know, I, I because when that person in the mirror changed, the person that went in the ring changed. I think boxing can save people. I, I do. Absolutely. It, it saved Absolutely. Me. And I think it saved you probably. Um, was there a point in your life, in your career, when boxing became the only place, this is going to sound crazy to a lot of people because it's a dangerous place, but is it, was it the only place you were safe? Absolutely. It was the only place I was safe. Look, it, it, as much as people ways. might think, there's rules, though. There's rules in there, right? When right you're, yeah. you're, everybody, you have on the same gloves. You have on, you know, there's there's a referee in there. There are rules. There are rules in there. Uh, out here in the real world, there were no rules. I mean, I could get treated as shitty as, as somebody wanted to treat me. There's no rules. Not, not really. I mean... No, boxing definitely saves lives. It saved my life many times. Um, and that's what I, I work with now with domestic violence and Chrissy's Champs, my nonprofit. We, we, uh, we, we work to put computers in local boxing gyms. We bring in tutors. We bring in mentors. We really try to set up where kids can box if they want to when they come in there. But they can also just come use the computers, come and talk to somebody, come and just have the tutors with, if they need help at school, whatever it is. Just This is what I did when I had my gym in, in Florida. 
I used to, I remember I, I hugged those kids every day when they walked in and I hugged them before they left. And I, in my mind, I'm helping them. But as time went on, I realized they were helping me. Um, so hopefully it goes both ways and, and we can make a difference with these kids with Tr Chrissy's chance right now. Well, one thing I want to say that you just brought that up. I run a, I run a charity foundation for 25 years. It's called the Dr. Atlas Foundation. And um, we're going we're gonna to send you a $5,000 check uh, to help you with, with your foundation. Thank you so much, Teddy. Yeah, we'll, we'll get all the information. Rob will get it from you. Um, and Fred, I know you have a great PR person, Fred Sternberg there. Um, we'll get it, and we'll get that check out to you so you can, you can help some people and uh, do that good work that you're doing. But and, let, let's just keep working together, Teddy. If I can come up there and do anything with you, I mean, we have to, so many people are against boxing, but they, like you just said, they, they have no idea how boxing has changed and saved so many lives. My last question, um, Ken started it with this, the introduction, 100%, you're a coal miner's daughter from Itman, West Virginia, as I said, 283 uh, population. What was it like when you met the original coal miner's daughter, Loretta Lynn, the country music legend? Tell us, uh, what was it like? Let me tell you, Teddy. <laughs> okay, so as you know, I mean, I was promoted by Don King. So I was, I made it, I feel like I made it to the top of the boxing world. And on that journey, I met, I met so many famous, famous people, whether it be movie stars, athletes, uh, you know, music people. I met so many different superstars when they brought me in to and sat me down at the Loretta Lynn concert right in front of her front row, middle seat. I started crying and I'm not that person because I'm I, I try to be the tough guy on the outside. I don't want people to think I'm ever weak. So I started crying. I'm like, oh, my God, I couldn't stop. I mean, I never had had that kind of emotion. I had never had that kind of awe about being with somebody. And so, so I got to meet her. And then afterwards, after the concert, she took me onto her bus and it was the same thing. I'm like, I'm trying to get away from her, but she was so cool. She just kept wanting to sit there and talk. And I mean, I would have stayed all day. I would have stayed all week. Um, but she was just so awesome. And then the hall of fame pulls off what they pulled off. I don't know if you got to see it, but when they did my, uh, announcement, they said, Christy, uh, we have one more thing for you. And it was a congratulations from Loretta Lynn. And so it, I was like, oh, my God, you people, because, you you know, oh, it was it was it was Saturday night at the dinner. And so all those people there that, of course, are not from West Virginia, Kentucky. They don't understand what West Virginia mean, or what Loretta Lynn means to us. Um, I, I just told him I had to step back to the mic. and said, you guys just have no idea what what she means to to us. So. What a beautiful, beautiful. And she's like 91 thing. years old. She, she's she's 91 years old. She has had to cancel a few of her concerts and things. So to get that was just. What did she say? Like, Can you tell us? In, she said, you know, she said uh, Christy, honey, we love you. And, and so proud of you. And congratulations on being inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. This is Loretta Lynn. Like, you know, like somebody has to tell you it's Loretta Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is Teddy Atlas and Ken Rideout. Um, and, and all of our fans and listeners saying thank you, Christy, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for writing this book. Thanks for telling this story. And thanks, I can say ahead of time, for all the people that I'm sure you're going to touch and you're going to maybe change their lives where they're hiding to and now they have the courage to come out of hiding and pursue a real life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teddy. Thank you, Ken. Hey, thank you, Christy. And I just want to say one thing before you go. For anyone listening, I hope people realize that one of the sayings that they uh, repeat in recovery is that you're only as sick as the secrets you keep. The truth will set you free. So hopefully Amen. that's what you got from Christy's conversation today. And her book is Fighting for Survival. If it's not, if, is it out already? I think we have an advanced copy. Is it available? Coming out on the 22nd, I believe. Yes, yes, on the 22nd. Perfect. Get yes. your pre-orders now on Amazon. Christy's book is awesome. Christy is awesome. Thank you for doing this. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank Bye, you, guys. Teddy. Thank you. God bless.